Good morning. In this webcast, we're going to look at reference frames and how you go about using and defining them in the gamut below K system. So reference frames are a physical realization of what's often referred to as a reference system. And that system normally is a definition of where the center of the system is and what the orientation of the axes are. We'll talk about that in more detail as we go through. This realization of that system requires some information about how to define positions and velocities in that reference frame. And this is needed by all geodetic systems, VOBI, SLR, GNSS. These days, in defining how this group of stations, for example, moves within the reference system, we now have nonlinear motions included as well. Historically, these reference frame realizations were defined just by linear motions of stations. So ultimately, when we're doing geodetic stuff, everything is relative. Even what is referred to as absolute positioning is relative to some coordinate origins. There's also a common misconception that the double differencing used in the gamut flow K system results in relative positioning only. That is not true. Double differencing is simply a method of eliminating the need to estimate clocks explicitly. The system is exactly the same as uh, point positioning and as positioning with explicit clock estimations. So when we talk about global positioning, what do we mean? Well, typically we define our center and rotation of the Earth. And the question is, how do you actually define where the center of the Earth is? And do we really care about where it is? And this depends a little on your goals. The basic definition of the center of the Earth comes from the Earth's gravity field and has to do with the first degree harmonic terms. And we set those to be zero if we want to have a center of mass origin of our system. Most implementations of GNSS coordinate systems are not center of mass. They are what is called center of figure, which means that they are relative to the positions of sites on the crust of the Earth. And the way to see the distinction is in a center of mass system, you can have a large atmospheric high pressure system move from the equator to the pole. And if the Earth were rigid, that motion would change the center of mass of the coordinate system, but it would not change the center of the figure. In the Earth, it's more complicated because as you move that mass, you also deform the Earth. And so the center of the figure does change. When we get into loading, that will be a critical issue for us to consider. For the moment, we're just going to take that our definition of the Earth is geometric. We will have an origin. We will have a set of orientations of axes. Now, the orientation of the axes also is something which moves considerably in the Earth. And so we end up having criterion for how we define how those axes move. The most common one used in geodetic processing is what's called a no net rotation criterion. And essentially, it's a surface integral of the angular velocities of all of the plates over the surface of the Earth sums to zero in this particular frame. It has no real physical meaning. It does not really represent a kinematic um, or dynamic system on the Earth because the crust itself is variable density. The plates are of all different sizes. There is an issue of how close to the boundaries of plates do we go in forming those integrals, etc. But it is something that can be mathematically constructed and from that reason is very conveniently used. We'll talk again a little later about potential other choices of those frames. So this is the current ITRF 2014 horizontal reference field. And so you can see the different motions of the sites here. The brown outlines the major plates that are involved around the world. And as we look at this motion, we can see several things happen. So what are those features we see? Well, firstly, you'll see that North American plate rotates around a point somewhere off South America. So if you look here, North America is rotating around this direction, around a point about here. Europe is rotating essentially opposite. That's the oceaning of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We'll notice also that Australia moves quite fast. And then Antarctica in this frame tends to be relatively small motions as we go through. So Eurasia and Africa also appear to have very similar motions. And that's quite critical for the southern uh, boundary of the Eurasian African plate 
space. And Antarctica, as I said, is moving very little in that particular reference frame. So as I said, ITRF 2014 is a no net rotation frame, which is a mathematical construction. For physical problems, you might consider other frames. You would really like something which is mantle fixed, but we really can't get that, A, because the mantle nominally is also moving. That's what's driving like tectonics typically. Uh, there is a frame called the hotspot reference frame, which refers to places in the mantle where there seems to be hotspots coming from the core mantle boundary that might provide that. And of course, the most common we might think about is using a specific re plate reference frame, the North American plate or a Eurasian plate. The different plates are based on Euler pole fits can be found in the GG tables directory. So we give you velocity fields and a priori coordinate files, which are based in each one of the major plates, uh, just to make that easy for you. So how do you go about choosing what reference frame you want to choose? And again, uh, this very much depends on your geophysical objectives. And again, there's no hard rules here. Uh, and this again is why the globe K part of the processing tends to be the more difficult part in that you have to decide precisely how you want to define things. What is important from the types of studies that you want to do. If you're working in a volcano, your reference frame might well simply be the sites around those volcanoes, particularly if it's an island site, such as the volcanoes in the Aleutian Island arc, for example, that may be your best choice. That's the closest thing you have. If you're looking at motions across a fault, you may choose one side of the fault to be the reference uh, frame, and then look at how that motion works on the other side. And similarly, if you're working in a subduction zone, Maybe the upper plate is the place where you have land and where you can actually put uh, stations and look at that as your basic reference frame. So we have also the major plate reference frames. So you can have uh, motion relative to Eurasia, Nubia, North America, South America, et cetera. But again, don't feel restricted by that. From some of the discussions that you have, really the idea of your reference frame is you want that frame which best visualizes the deforming region that you are looking at. And so you might consider taking something like the Central Valley of California as a reference frame, or the non-deforming part of the Anatolian plate, uh, and small coherent regions where you have. And again, as I said, you may well just simply have a local reference frame that you get from volcanoes or geothermal fields, etc. So expressing velocities in the ITRF is not very meaningful when you want to look at the deformation across a plate boundary, for example. So if you take North America in that no net rotation frame, North America itself is rotating out this way. The Pacific plate is moving up here. So when you plot velocities near the San Andreas fault and in the boundary of the plate here, you see large vectors going this way and that way. What's a much better way to look at it typically would be to fix a pin essentially at North America and then move the uh, motion of the Pacific place north of that. And again, the complexity you see here is that North America is a complicated plate and effectively everything west of the Rocky Mountains is actually moving. And so even in what is conventionally considered the North America fixed frame, you still have motions across most of this part of Nevada and California, for example. And so you might choose something like a Mojave Desert frame. Again, what you do depends precisely on what types of problems you are trying to study. So what are the basic issues that we come with with reference frame uh, realization? So the concept is to align yourself to an estimated set of positions and velocities of sites whose motions are known and have physical significance for the analysis that you're trying to perform. For example, the gauge processing, which is processes the North American uh, network of the Americas, the noted data set, for example, we realize that frame in the North American plate frame. So most of the sites in the Eastern United States in that frame have very small motions. And then we see all of the complicated deformation happening in the Western boundary part of that motion. In Gamut Globe K, Geolog is the module that does that realization of your reference frame. And then it computes the variance covariance matrix in the aligned reference frame itself. And so when you want to do the transformation, you can imagine that your network is a set of points and you want to rotate, translate those points and possibly scale the network as you go through. 
These are often called, they are called, helmet transformations. And so n equals three is normally just either translation only, or it could be just rotations. Six is translation and rotation. This is what we typically use. But a very common thing to use in the community is a seven perimeter helmet transformation, which also includes scale. And we're gonna come back and talk about scale because this is one of those areas of geodetic analyses where users often don't realize what's happening when they've been looking at reference frames in which scale has been removed. So the questions you need to decide is how many parameters do you want to estimate? And then more importantly, what sites are going to actually be used to determine those parameters you have? And this is where the shell script SH gen stats comes into play because it will generate a list of reference frame stations for you based on those stations in your network and your time series that have low levels of correlated noise in them. And um, we'll talk about time series net analyses later on. And then having determined the stations, you need to know the positions and the velocities in those reference frame sites. So again, if you use one of our standard a priori files, you can get that for individual plates for the standard uh, ITRF 2014 sites, or you can define your own set of motions. And we'll talk about some ways that you can do that as you go. The final decision to make is how to treat heights when you calculate the transformation between the two reference frames. And again, normally in all geodetic analyses, the height is more poorly determined than the horizontal components, generally by about a factor of three. But in addition to that, as we'll see, and we've briefly seen when we look at loading, loading phenomena tends to affect the heights to a much greater level than it does horizontal components. And so your linear motion in your reference frame, for example, is not accounting for the fact that the heights are probably varying due to various loading phenomena, annual signals, for example. So one way you can minimize the impact of that is to downweight the heights in doing that transformation. So you effectively use only the horizontal components. This is done with a command in geolog, which is not pronounceable, but it's condition on the height variances. And it allows you to set the weight you're going to give to the height. And the nominal default value is to have the heights downweighted in variance space by a factor of 10 over the horizontal components. And that factor of 10 is approximately three in standard deviation. But if you want to downweight the heights, and this is something we often do, we make that value something like a thousand. And in the gauge processing in particular, that is what is done to minimize the impacts of height variations in the horizontal components of your motion. But again, if you want to study heights, then this is something you need to carefully think about as you go through. There are two other arguments in this command, which if you look in the help, we'll tell you about, and that has to do with the sigma limits of automatically discarding sites from the reference frame realization, which aren't well determined on a particular day as we go through. So this reference frame implementation, so basically any vector can be mapped from one coordinate system to another through translation, rotation, and scale. And again, the important thing to note about scale is that since we're pretty much on a spherical Earth, scale ultimately results in the average height change in your uh, network. And this is a very common thing to see if you look at all of the IGS publications, all of the IHRF 2014's variations. Scale has been estimated and scale changes get estimated in those systems. And what that's doing is changing the average height variation in your network. And sometimes that is what you want to do. Sometimes it may not be precisely what you want to do. That is the big decision that you often need to make when doing rotation. So translation is mathematically very simple. We move a point P from here, we translate the frame to T, and that simply becomes that the new coordinates are just the original coordinates plus the transformation term. Rotation is also similar. We define omega as a rotation vector, and then the displacement, or it could be a velocity of rotation, if we're looking at that, at velocities, and we rotate omega around some pole, and then the displacements of the sites are perpendicular to that pole. Mathematically, that is written that D is just omega cross the uh, position of the original station. That the transformation for small values of the rotation angles can be written simply now as a small rotational matrix. And so you'll see that 
if I want to determine these angles, then my partial derivatives are going to be the positions of the stations to determine those. Then finally, scale just simply takes the point P and then moves it out uh, radially from that, like blowing up a balloon. As you blow up a balloon, you make things larger. It also does change the intersite distances by a scaling amount as well, but it's the height that you see change in terms of coordinates. You can run along the radial essentially. So it's a direct measurement of that. And as I said, again, heights is something where you really want to think carefully about how you're doing this. So the helmet transformation itself, with all of those terms in there, is the new position of our site is simply the original position of our site, translation, rotational terms, and then plus the scale um, term at the beginning. And that's, um, yeah. So, and so the scale, as you'll notice, comes down the diagonal of that matrix as we go through. For velocity, it's just the time derivatives of those. But again, because of the fact that the rotations are small and the velocities are small, these sort of cross terms disappear from the equation because we neglect them since the rotational rates are typically 10 to the minus six radians per year. And uh, so the scale changes are also very small for that. And so it's basically the same set of partials whether you're dealing with velocities or with position estimates as you go through. And that's what's implemented in Globe K is to estimate those parameters and in the estimation, what we're looking at is we take the difference between our a priori value for the site position, where we think it is located based on our frame realization, and where we actually see it on that day. And we estimate the translations, the rotations, and possibly the scale to minimize that difference. So in our geodetic analyses, the outputs from gamma they're loosely constrained solutions. And so the relative positions are well determined. In fact, there is a baseline length output from gamut, which even if you uh, look, if you have very poorly determined absolute positions, you'll find the baseline lengths, the distances between sites are well determined. And then we need an expression, a way to move those coordinates into a well-defined reference frame. And so there's sort of two aspects to this. One is the theoretical one of what block do you want to do? What type of reference frame do you want? Mantle fixed, no net rotation, etc. And then this often defines what one would call the reference system that you are using. And then there is the realization of that, of how do you actually in practice go about achieving that definition of the system that you want. And there's two fundamental techniques one can use here. One called finite constraints. That's where you say, these sites and positions, I know their positions and velocities within a certain a priori standard deviation, and I'm going to constrain my system to make those sites move in that fashion. And then there is the generalized constraints, and this is the geolog approach, where you minimize the difference between the coordinate residuals while adjusting estimates of the rotation, translation, and scale. And so this second one does not change the relative positions of the sites, um, provided you're not estimating. If you estimate scale, you will scale the baseline lengths with it, but you're not estimating scale, translation and rotation does not internally deform the network. And that's why we like this particular approach as the most flexible, the one which puts the least artifact in if your coordinate system is not as of high quality as you think it should be. So there's also a consideration that there are some things you do where you want to have the GNSS orbits and the Earth orientation parameters to be consistent. And that only happens when you're dealing with the no net rotation reference frame. Um, and again, often physical reference frames are needed to visualize motions. And you want a robust method of doing this so that you don't end up having to do specialized processing on individual days. So when we try to do this in uh, globe K. If we want to do the finite constraints, conceptually this might be the simplest way to do it. This is actually done purely in globe K. Geolog is not called when you do this, and therefore your print file is where your results would go. And as I said, we don't really recommend this approach in general, simply because if you over-constrain the sites, you actually distort the positions and velocities of the other sites. But in small networks, and particularly things where you may have large motions happening, like volcanoes, then if you have a set of sites around the edges of your volcano that you know the positions and velocities of well, 
then you can use this type of approach uh, to do it. You can also do the standard geolog approach as well. And again, in that mode of experimenting with globe K, it's good to try both approaches and see how they work. But a typical example of doing this might be to have, again, your combined coordinate file from here. You have an APR northeast up, which says you have 10 meter uncertainties in each of the station positions, one meter per year velocity. But then there's this group of stations where you say, okay, I know their positions within five millimeters in north and east and a centimeter in vertical, and I know their horizontal motions. And then maybe some of the stations, I don't know the motions as well as I said. But again, the question is, where do you come up with these numbers? And if you actually look at how well we, in theory, know these coordinates, they're extremely well known. This can be useful when you only have one or two reference sites or very local data. And as I said, with large networks, any bad a priori coordinates, we've already seen loading again can be large. So if you're constraining the heights this way, some part of that loading signal is going to map in an unknown way into the rest of the stations in your network as you go through. So when we do it with a generalized constraint approach, and again, here we're going to be estimating rotation translation to bring our frames together. Here again, we have the same APR coordinate, but now this is in the geolog command file. And in this particular case, I've decided just to do three uh, parameters, the translations and the rotation. So the POSORG command is doing this. If I am also doing velocities, I would have a VELORG command. And then I list the sites that I want to use, Algonquin, Pytown, DRAO, for example, being sim similar with that previous case. And in this case, I'm also specifying that the heights of the um, sites should be within, um, it should be downweighted by about a factor of 10, which is precisely what we want to do. And then we have the stabilization, and we're going to iterate this for four iterations. The other arguments in Stabit, this has to do with the weight between a constant weight for the stations and a site dependent weight, etc. We can look in more detail at those commands later on. So in here, all the reference coordinates are free to adjust. That phenomenon has become more apparent. And we can also detect outliers in the reference frame coordinates as we go through. Network does rotate and translate, but does not distort when we do this. There's no strain except for a rotational strain component. And this works best when we have a lot of redundancy in our systems. And if you have rotation estimated, you want to have geometrically to make sure that your stations are on the outsides of your network as you go through. So we define the reference frame. You can create an APR file for use in Geolog, or you can use one of the ones that we already define. A very common thing to do would be if you're looking, say, at a plate um, motion, you can look at a microplate, you can set the velocities of all the sites on this little local plate to be zero and use those as the reference frame sites. You can also, if you already have some a priori estimate of how the sites on the other side of your fault are moving, those can also be included in the reference frame list and in the APR sites with their velocities. And then for doing position analyses, you could use all the sites in your network as you go through. You can also use in Geolog a command called plate. And that will allow you to select a region of stations, or a list of stations, and estimate their velocities as an Euler pole, which you can then use to predict what their theoretical motions would be if they were rigidly attached to that microplate that you had defined. So for globalization and global sets of sites, we certainly like to use a large number of them. Uh, or 40 or more is always very good for determining ITRF velocities, for example. And again, in the IGB command file, uh, when used with the earthquake file, which basically tells the software where there are discontinuities in individual stations as we go through, um, you can obtain that information and use it. You can also combine with the MIT Sinex files. These are available from the Crustal Dynamics Information System. We process, process 350 stations every day. Uh, our Sinex files go back into the 1990s. We are regenerating those Sinex files right now for the Repro 3 effort. And so in a year from now, there should be a whole new set of these files available. And you can use you know, four to six common sites between those and use that as a method to tie yourself into the ITRF 2014 system. Go. Again, just as the warning, which is in the help 
So when you use H2 global, if you've run gamut in baseline mode and you want to do this, you should make sure you include the minus A option, which will ensure that you do not artificially apply rotation and translation in your, trans in your um, conversion into the binary H files. For the global stabilization, there's also a hierarchical list of stations that you can use. These stabilization lists, and you can create your same for your sites. The idea here is that each uh, site can have a, several different site choices, and you will use just one of the sites in that particular choice. The list, the names get separated by slashes to denote that they're of this type. That's a good way to stop individual regions having a lot of weight in the transformation parameters. We do this for, again, the node gauge analysis, where, again, part of the output that can come from just a gen, SH gen stats is a list of this type where the sites are in a grid across your whole network area. And one site from each of the grid cells will be chosen in a particular stabilization. Um, and if there's more than one site, if that site's available, if the first site's not available, the second will be used, et cetera. And again, although global frame stabilization is useful, and this is what you actually did in the um, test example that you ran when you installed Gamut, uh, that's not necessarily what you want to do for doing your processing. So one of, again, subtle things in the processing is whether to actually use these global Sinex files or we have binary versions of the files as well. We'll talk about the caveats with these files in a second. So the advantage is that when you use these, you have a very large number of reference frame sites that you can choose from. You have to really allow orientation, EOP uh, variations when you do this. And if you're using the GLX files that are available from the MIT FTP site, these have orbits in them. And that can be problematic when you merge with the orbit processing that you have done. And primarily because the GLX files are generated as part of our operational processing, so the ones from 2002, for example, were generated in the last reprocessing using the orbit models that we used back at that point. We no longer use that style of orbit model. And so these files really aren't consistent with the way we generate orbits these days. That is the advantage of using the Sinex files, because in there, the orbits are actually fixed already, or they're constrained to the values for the MIT orbit determination, and you don't have to explicitly worry about them. So some of the disadvantages of these things, you do need to keep the models processing. This is most important if you're trying to merge the orbits together, which we do not recommend you try to do. In the GLX files, if you've run in baseline mode, you don't have orbits, so you won't see a uh, conflict in the orbit modeling as you put them together. But in the GLX files, the radiation parameters are very loose, and there is a looseness to those files in terms of an absolute global reference frame that you can improve upon if you do better choice of the radiation pressure modeling. And again, that is something which is a bit of a specialized art to do. You also have to worry a little that there can be bad data in the global H files. Uh, again, there's ways to remove those. But the metadata that we used when we process the data, sometimes there's an antenna change that we do not realize has happened until several months after the change. And so if you process the data at that same interval, you may be using a different uh, space center model than we use for the site, and that can cause problems. Uh, and these files can be large, um, and although the Sinex file is a reasonable size because it doesn't actually have orbits in them. So the GLX files you can obtain from the F Everest MIT uh, FTP site. They're stored under years. And again, the important thing to remember here is that the satellite base center offsets are freely estimated in those files. And so you should normally have an APR SV ant, which is the command which will force the satellite uh, face center model values to their a priori coordinates. If you want to use the MIT Sinex files, you can get them from CDDIS. These are stored under weeks. And if you want to, you don't actually have to just use the MIT ones. You could download the IGS Sinex files and do exactly the same processing with them, or the scripts in ones or JPL. Again, interesting thing for experimentation is what happens when you try to do that. In our Sinex, the base center offsets for the satellites are all constrained to a millimeter, so you don't need to worry too much about that. So when you're doing stabilization using local or regional sites, then you again typically want to have 
uh, 10 or more well-distributed sites around your region. And again, for time series analysis, the reason we want to have a large number of them is that on any given day, a site might have some issue. And if you have enough stations, you can automatically exclude that site from that. And again, you need to know well-known coordinates of these sites. And this is one you have to think carefully about uh, before you start your processing, because the sites you want to use have to be included in the gamut processing. And so when you go through your gamut processing from the very beginning, this is one of those early choices that you want to make. You should look at where your region is. Again, ideally, we like to include as many IGS stations around our region as we can. We'll talk about where you find out about IGS stations a little later. And by including a reasonable number of those on any given day, some of them may not be available. Some of them will only exist for certain periods of time. You have the ability to span the coordinate system across your whole span of data that you're having. And again, you would like to make sure that your sites have symmetric coverage. If you're doing a regional network, you want sites to surround it completely, not to be all on one side, for example. If you're in a small network and doing translation only, that's not so critical. But when you do rotation, you definitely want sites all the way around your network of interest. So this is the IGS reference frame uh, site list. This is their core reference frame. This is a relatively small number of sites. This is the sites that the IGS aligns to each day. This figure was just recently generated. And one of the bad signs on this figure is all the red dots are sites which are not actually returning data at the moment when this figure was generated. If you go and look at this, fight, with this slide at the um, www.igs.org, then you'll find it will look different because it depends on the specific sites as you go through. So these are the core stations, but there is actually many more reference frame stations. And so that's the group which is given here. And if you actually look in ITRF 2014, there is a large number of stations that you get to choose from. And so in addition to these, there are many more stations potentially available out there, several hundred to choose from. And again, the red in here, you'll notice that, you know, depending on which region of the world you're in, things like South America, you can have some issues with the number of stations. Africa is always very low density as we go across. Uh, Russia in certain parts can be very problematic. Uh, North America and Australia tend to be fairly high density. In fact, the US has very, very large numbers of stations that you can potentially choose from um, because of the noted network and the cause network run by the National Geodetic Survey. So the frame implementation, the, uh, again, you want to use sites who have well-known positions and velocities. It doesn't matter that the site's moving. It's just you would like them to be moving in a very systematic fashion, linear motion, ideally, but also if in things like the ITRF 2014's um, APR file, you can also have post seismic deformation model, which these days is actually critical because there's been very large earthquakes over the last decade that still have ongoing motion, which is non-linear associated with them. And you get your stab site list again, and you can use the guides from the IGB 14 one, which is available in the, um, uh, the, the GG standard distribution as we go through. And as I said, decide early precisely what you want to do, because once you've done the gamut processing, it's much more difficult to go back and add sites. You, uh, normally, you might have to actually redo your processing if you're missing a substantial amount of work. So the general rules for um, stabilizations of your time series, if you're dealing with a small network, translation only in GeoLog is possible. When you do that, you want to make sure you constrain the EOP parameters in globe K. And again, if the network is small, large uncertainties in the earth orientation parameters, rotation, don't actually have that much effect on the coordinates. So again, in terms of experimentation, when you want to see how things vary as you make dis decisions, you could change the APR wob, which is the whole of motion wobble component, the APR UT ter one terms, you could change those and see how they actually affect your results as you go across. Again, our standard basic approach is always just to do translation and rotation. And again, when you do this, you must keep the EOPs loose in Globe K. And um, you also, when you translate, if you run baseline mode in gamut, the default now in H to global 
is to automatically loosen your EOP values. And so you don't need to do this. This has, again, there's detailed information on this in the help file. If you are merging with other things when you run HD global, you want to make sure you use the minus A option to turn that feature off. This feature is automatically on because we have many users who don't know they should do that and end up distorting their networks because their system is not free to rotate as they think it is as we go through. If you're estimating scale in Geolog, you must also estimate scale in the globe K. So, and if you don't do that, it, um, it won't generate an error, but it will do strange distortions of your network when you look at it. Um, and again, because the scale and all of these terms, rotations, et cetera, in Geolog, it's not implemented by just doing the direct helmet transformation. It's implemented by applying a constraint to the covariance matrix. And that's how we reduce the, we determine the uncertainties in the covariance matrix by applying these constraints as we go through. So when you're doing this in the first pass for editing, as I said earlier, one often just uses the stabilization lists from those sites which are available on most days, or it could just be the ones from the ITRF, uh, the IGB-14 system, for example. And you wanna make sure you have a reasonable number of them. So for your final work, then having iterated your system and worked out which sites in your network are extremely well behaved, you can use those sites in your stabilization list to help make the transformation be appropriate to your area of research and the place where you're most interested in seeing things. And this system often gets iterated between doing velocity fields, time series analysis with that new set of velocity fields to look at the good sites, work out which have slow RMS, where there's outliers, potentially removing outlier days, et cetera, and then regenerating the velocity field with the newly generated uh, constraints and process noise models as you go through. We're going to have one lecture later on on large network processing. And if you're in this mode, we now have this program called TSCon, which actually does many different things. But one of the things it does do is it basically reads all of the command files that Geolog can read. And in fact, it takes a command file, which is very similar to the Geolog command file. And this allows you to test your ideas of what stations you want to use in stabilization, et cetera. And it does it using time series, so it's a very fast processing. Then when you're happy with what you have, you can apply it to the bloke K solution to getting uh, your final estimates. Now, I keep talking about scale. And this is something which we've seen come up over the last few years a number of times. And it comes up because people now are very interested in studying height variations due to hydrological loading, the droughts in California and how things have changed, um, how the height has changed in that. Now, the default position for most groups to analyzing GNSS data is to automatically include a scale estimate when they're aligning to their reference frame. And when you do that, it's maybe the right thing to do. But when you do it, because the Earth's almost spherical, that scale change effectively is an average height variation going on. If you go back and read the papers that have been written on global deformation processes, one of the things you will realize is that there is a large annual signal that exists in loading because the Northern Hemisphere with its large land masses in the winter accumulates a lot of ice and snow on it. That loading pushes all of the stations down in the Northern Hemisphere and that happens with a very strong annual signal. When you are estimating scale changes, those scale changes reflect that height variation in the Northern Hemisphere. The height estimates that you obtain from that solution are then the residual piece that's left over. So you can look at individual areas and you've taken out the large overall scale. But if you're interested in full hemispheres height variations due to loading, then estimating the scale changes is not what you want to do. Also, when you're comparing heights and looking at things between different analysis groups and the way things are processed, you'll see online now there are many different time series that you can actually go and look at and download and manipulate. Look at how they have done scale. In just about every case, the, UN, the um, University of Nevada solutions, the IGS solutions, the solutions done at JPL, 
everybody except the gauge analysis, which is done through UNAVCO, estimates scale changes. And when you do that, it has a major impact on your height. This is discussed actually at UNAVCO if you want to read more detail about it. And we also talk about it in the Herring et al. 2016 reviews of geophysics paper, where we look at the processing techniques that we used for the plate boundary observatory system as we go. So scale estimates, as I said, are related to the mean height differences over your reference sites. And whether you remove them or not is an open question. The important thing is to be aware that when you estimate scale, or when you look at results where scale has been estimated, the mean height variations have been removed. We'll see the impact of that in a few slides from now. Now, there's even more subtle issues associated with this, which is something which, again, is something to keep in mind. And this is something where the difference between double difference processing as implemented in gamma and the alternative, which is precise point positioning, which we do not, uh, which we're not going to cover in this class, but is a very common processing technique used at the moment. And in precise point positioning, you are taking clocks and potentially phase bias information and just processing single stations at a time. It has a lot of advantage of convenience in terms of just being able to do a single station. And in that case, if you need to add a station to your processing, you can just go back and do that one station. So it's a very popular processing technique. But it does assume that the orbits are absolutely fixed and it assumes that the satellite clocks are absolutely known. Neither of those two things is correct. And so the PPP processing itself, the uncertainties that come out of that, do not reflect the actual uncertainties of those results. They only reflect a certain part of the error noise. However, they do, from a clock point of view, have some characteristics, that the clocks are determined from a global network of stations. And when you do a continental or a regional scale network with double differencing processing, that solution does take into account the uncertainties in the clocks. And because you're in a region, the satellites essentially at the edges of your network have fewer determinations of their clock parameters and their clocks are not as well determined as they would be had you processed a global network. The consequence we see of this is that there is high correlations between all the heights in the sites of a regionally processed double difference network as we do it. And that gets made even larger in our down weighting of our reference frame verticals when we actually do the um, conversion into the local reference frame. If you're interested in horizontal motions of things, which many, many people are, this is not an issue. In fact, it's the way you want to do things because it makes the horizontals as high a quality as they can. They're not corrupted potentially by unknown height variations happening in your network. Now, one thing you can do to solve this, even for your own local networks, is adding stations that come from a global solution can considerably help. And that's why we're recommending that potentially you want to use the MIT Sinex files. And what's interesting in this combination, you add it into the GLOW-K GDL file, but you don't actually have to use all the stations from that Sinex file. There's 350 of them. You only need to use the stations that overlap with the stations in your network. And that can be a small number, a few. And you will see you gain the benefit from that global determination of the clocks in the satellites when you do that. And you then have sigmas on your positions which reflect the uncertainty of the clocks and in your processing. The orbits you've still pretty much may have assumed to be fixed at this point, um, but again, so there is a small piece of your error bar that you're missing. But this issue of including sites from the global network is one which is an important step to take if you're interested in the absolute height variations of your um, sites in your network. And we're going to show you an impact of doing that. And this is from some tests we've been running recently on GNSS multi-constellation solutions. And we've been looking at 98 stations that span, that come from the NODA network. These stations cover Alaska and the Western United States. And the particular analysis we're doing, here's about three months of data. And we've processed it. 
and we've processed it as a single 98 station network in gamut. Uh, it could have, in theory, done two 50 station networks and then combined them together in um, Globe K. 98 is about close. The maximum number of stations you can use in gamut uh, is 99, and that has to do with some deep down internal encoding of how information is stored. And if you go above 99, you basically overwrite values in uh, an indexing arrays. And so you cannot do more than 99 stations in gamut at one time. So you have to divide the network and combine them in globe K if you want to do more stations than that. So the next station, next slide we're going to talk through a bit and it's going to sort of give you the results of this GNSS combination as we go through. So the numbers that are being shown here, these are the median weighted root mean squared positions of the estimates after taking out simple linear trends from the time series of these 98 days of data that were processed from 2019. The nomenclature here is G means that GPS was used in the solution, E means Galileo was used, and then R is that GLONASS was used. So the group of stations solutions up here, MIT, G, R, and E, these are just simply the results from the 98 station network processed. And in the first column, we look at when we don't estimate the scales changes, we just do rotation translation. In this column, we estimate scale changes across this network. And when we're doing that estimated scale, we actually still have the heights downweighted by a factor of a thousand relative to the horizontal components. So this is just purely the MIT solution. These solutions are where we actually add in the Sinex files that are available from CBIS. And it is just four stations. So when we do this combinations, the number of stations we're processing is still 98 stations. This run goes quite fast because we're not processing 350 stations plus our 98 stations. And what you'll notice is that in the horizontal components, and to guide your eye, the yellow boxes highlight those numbers which are the smallest of these median values. So you'll see in East, everybody is very, very similar. 0.78 is the minimum. Um, and it doesn't matter too much whether we use just GPS or whether we use GPS and Galileo or GPS, Galileo and GLONASS. And then in the north, again, the numbers are quite similar, 0.69. And you'll see that's the same for these two. The interesting thing here is that adding um, they have other GNSS systems didn't hurt our solution. That's sometimes actually a, a process that happens with GNSS at the moment is that adding other constellations increases the scatter. Now in the up is where we're really focusing in this part of this talk. And what you'll notice is that in our original solution, we have about a 5.1 millimeter average median RMS scatter across our sites. And when we add the other constellations, that actually does improve um, down to 4.8 and 4.9 millimeters. A little bit worse when we add GLONASS or a little degradation. We think that's partly because the phase center models for GLONASS satellites may not be fully consistent with the uh, Galileo ones and the GPS ones that we are using. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that when we add in those four stations from the global networks, this values drop down to about 4.5 millimeters. Uh, we have compared these results with Gypsy uh, PPP results, and this is um, smaller than the RMS scatters that we see with Gypsy PPP for the same network of stations. Now again, to give you the impact of estimating scale, once we estimate scale, we are now down to from five millimeters down to three millimeters. So you can see the dramatic impact. And what that is saying is that this whole network is essentially lifting up and down in height uh, each day. And all the stations are essentially seeing that same height. When we estimate the scale, we take out that average value. And in fact, the scale estimates we have can be derived simply by the average height changes of the reference frame stations across here. And again, interestingly, for the GNSS processing, we see that things actually do improve when we add the other constellations here. And again, there's very little change in the horizontal RMS because we've downweighted the heights in doing the transformation. And so the fact that the scale and the heights are changing don't affect the transformation parameters very much. And then finally, when we add in the um, global sites from the GNSS, we'll notice now it's not 
as quite a dramatic improvement as we saw before. In fact, with the pure GPS solution, it gets a tad uh, worse. And that uh, is not completely clear, but again, relatively small number of statistics here. And our best height RMS we see here is about three millimeters across this 98 station network. So the take home messages from here is that when you estimate scales, you typically dramatically increase, decrease the RMS scatter of the height in an absolute sense. If I look at height differences between stations, you'll find that they are not affected by any of this uh, type of variation. And the height, because of the way we've configured this, the horizontal components are really not affected by the horizontal. And again, this sub-millimeter performance in median RMS scatters across these networks. That is the standard expectation we have for high quality GNSS processing as we go forward at the moment. So the velocities in the time series that we look at, um, again, generally you do the same thing between the two, but there is somewhat different considerations between them. So when you consider velocity solutions, um, sometimes the physical reference is quite important here because you're looking at a particular tectonic process that you want to do. And because you've combined many, many typically years of data together, you're not that sensitive to station dropouts for individual periods of times because the other stations in the solution sort of holds the reference frame together. When you're doing time series, you're looking at the reference frame realization every single day. And for time series, often the physical reference is not that important. You're more interested in detecting which sites have nonlinear motions potentially, which ones have outliers, et cetera. However, your reference frame realization now be, does become sensitive to stations dropping out. And again, that's why we like to use a large number of stations so that you can afford on any particular day to have some number of them either be generating anomalous results, potentially due to ice and snow on antennas, or just maybe if it's um, an instrumentation failure, et cetera, as you go through. So, um, and so basically our general uh, approach in reference frame for both velocities and time series is to use all stations that have well-defined positions and velocities and have motions which are consistent with your model of that motion. That could be a nice linear motion or it might be some simple post seismic deformation. You don't want to use sites that are showing large irregular variations due to loading, for example, etc. And so as many sites as you can in terms of the reference frame realization is the way that we think about doing these types of things. Now, the other thing you think about is how you might go about referencing to a horizontal block, an individual plate, for example. And again, this is all done in GLORG. And the standard way we do this is we do a first solution where we stabilize in the normal way to something like the ITRF no net rotation frame. But then we're able to define blocks and you do that with the command called plate, and then you give it a name for the plate. Uh, it's up to eight characters long. Uh, and then you list the stations that are associated with that plate. You can issue this command multiple times. So if you have lots of stations, you can have multiple plate NOAM, North America lines if you wish to, they just keep getting added. Uh, and again, this is one where you have a specific plate where you've defined it with some stations here. So after the stabilization is done, Geolog will estimate the Euler poles using this group of stations as you go through. And then that set of Euler poles can be used to come up with what the rigid motion models of these sites would be if they were originally attached to that plate. So when you define the plates, you can afford to have a little bit of deformations at the edges of the plates, because again, it's simply going to have your best rotation plate. And then there's a shell script sh org to vel that actually reads the output of GLORG for this type of solution and generates velocity field files that have all the sites given in velocities based on the different plates that you have chosen uh, in your solution as you go. And then this is the file that you would then use in a second iteration as the apriori coordinate file to look at things. Now, again, this might be something physical like North America, but it could be your own little microplate that you're looking at. So we're going to give an example of this. This comes from McCluskey et al. in 2000. It's for the Anatolian block in the Aegean uh, reference frame. So this first solution you see here, this is Turkey, uh, Greece sitting over here. And this is the North Anatolian fault. And we see Turkey being 
uh, ejected out to the side here, and then subduction along the Aegean arc down here. And in this particular frame, all these stations up here, which you can see have very small vectors on them. This is a 20 millimeter per year vector scale and 95% confidence ellipses. It's reference to this block of stations up here, which are actually, there's more stations up here. The whole of Eurasia was used to help define this reference frame. And this is telling you in the Eurasian reference frame as defined in ITRF 2008, I think for this particular paper, um, these sites are on that stable reference frame. But now for doing the geophysics in the problem, we're really more interested in what is happening in here. And so you can sort of see this looks like a curving arc, but that's about all you can really tell from that figure is that these velocities seem to come around here and curve and move down. They move at you know, fairly fast rates of maybe 30 millimeters per year. But what happens if we look at it in this group of stations over here? And this is where we get to choose our own little reference frame. So now what's happened is a group of stations over on the stable part of the Anatolian block has been used to define this. In fact, more stations again, which don't appear on the map over here. And now we can start seeing much more detail about how this is varying. And in fact, you can now see that a lot of the motion um, is subducting down here. We have a larger velocity, smaller velocities over here. There's much more detail we can see. In the Eurasia part of the frame, now we have all these big vectors, and so we can't see too much of what's happening up in this part anymore. But this is the reason you go about defining local reference frames to highlight the types of motions that you can see. And you can see a right lateral uh, motion term slipping up over here as you go across. Um, and there's left lateral shear, sorry, and dilatation around roads uh, in this particular representation. So the final thoughts on the subject of reference frames. This is, in some senses, maybe the hardest thing you need to decide. It's the place where you make all the decisions about how you want to present results that best show the result that you want to convey. So in GeoLog, the a priori coordinate velocity can be changed from what was actually used in the GLOBE-K processing. And as I said, we often, for very large solutions, will run GLOBE-K with a no net rotation uh, frame. We use the com file command to save the common file from that and potentially the sol file to make, we explicitly name the sol file so we have a unique name for it. Once we've done that in GeoLog as its standalone program, we can then play around with the reference frame and change different ones to go through. And when we do this, we want to make sure that our a priori velocity signals are loosely constrained. Typically plus or minus a meter per year is perfectly fine. We have certain reference frames that we automatically define like Eurasia, IGS 2014, et cetera. And then program plate you can use to list all of the different plates that are automatically known about. Uh, the plate program can also take other Euler poles. You can have your own defined if you look for help. Uh, you can define files with your own plates in there, et cetera. And you can use that and geolog and sh org to bell to make those. And again, for many local networks, the reference frame can be simply defined by having zero velocities on those sites. In the previous example, we showed the north, the uh, stable part of the Anatolian velocity. The coordinate file used there simply had zero velocities for all of those sites, even though there is still some small internal deformation happening in those blocks as we go through. And so these are the decisions you need to make. And it's sometimes worthwhile just looking at the literature that other to see how other groups have done this in different papers. Um, this is not a unique to gamut and globe K issue. It is a unique to how you go about interpreting geophysical results. Thank you.